Oh, thank you, Sam. And I've, I'm going to go through the slides somewhat closely today, and I'll start with the table of contents, uh, just explaining what we're going to do for the next two hours. This is a fundamentals um, HSA seminar, which it means it's good for somebody who's new to HSAs. It's also a good review for somebody who works with them infrequently um, or just wants a refresher. I am going to spend a little time up front just making sure everybody knows the definitions, what is an HSA, why do we have HSAs. Uh, then we're going to jump right into kind of establishing an HSA, how do you open one, what are common questions you're going to get, what are some trips tricks and traps and, and problems that people have had, and then we'll finish with distributions and reporting, uh, and a little bit at the end about health care reform and how that's impacting um, the HSA business. I'm going to move fairly rapidly, but there will be a chance um, for questions as well. And, I, you know, just kind of as background, you know, what is an HSA or what is consumer-driven health care? Um, HSAs are a part of a a movement some people would call called consumer driven health care and if you're offering HSAs you're going to get pulled into that movement a little bit just by some of the questions you receive and it's the idea is that if we give consumers control over their own money um, they will help bring the cost of health care down because consumerism um, you know de derives cheaper prices and better service because uh, that's what consumers do um, and regardless of whether you buy into that or not, there's really three big types of programs that are somewhat consumer-driven health care. HSA is what we're going to spend two hours on. Um, but before we jump into that, I wanted to mention health care reimbursement accounts, or HRAs. Uh, this webinar is not about HRAs, but if you're going to offer HSAs, you should at least know these are out there. And I think you, your bank or your, your credit union will sooner or later get asked to do an HRA, because for some employer groups, HRAs are actually are a better choice than H HSAs. HRAs and HSAs are similar beyond just their acronyms being close in that they're both consumer-driven health plans. They give the, the money to the individual to spend directly on their insurance. But from a banking perspective, they're quite different. An HRA is an employer-funded program, and it generally doesn't need to be funded at all, meaning that uh, you can simply re submit receipts to your employer that are eligible for medical expenses, and then your employer will reimburse them. The employer doesn't need to have a, an account to do that. They can just you know, reimburse it out of current money. Um, so the similarities with HSAs differ quite a bit. Um, from an administration perspective, and really most HSA custodians choose not to offer um, HRAs. And, and I guess the important learning point here is just that sooner or later somebody's going to mix up HRAs and HSAs, or they're going to be talking about one, and um, you're going to be talking about another. It's just something to look out for. And, and most likely you will not offer HRAs, so as soon as you realize what they're really talking about is an HRA, um, they're better off, um, you know, talking to somebody else in most cases. And the, the thing to look for is employer money um, versus, um, well, employer only money. It's a little more complicated. That's why there's some confusion. But employer only money is one indication of an HRA. The other one is flexible spending accounts, or some people call these medical reimbursement accounts. This is a more typical plan that's been out there for a while that allows employees to defer a portion of their pay um, through payroll deferral and then use that money for medical expenses. This is use it or lose it. So the HSA is usually compared to FSAs favorably because in HSA the money is saved and grows um, forever. Um, but I wanted to mention FSAs right now too because these are changing next year. And again, if you offer HSAs, you're going to bump into this FSA discussion. And starting in 2013, FSAs are capped at $2,500, which is quite a bit less than HSA limits. Um, so next year, HSAs are even going to be more competitive against FSAs. And I think you'll see some employer groups and individuals um, asking questions about FSAs and H HSAs. Just May uh, of this year, the IRS came out with some additional in information on that, more for an advanced seminar. but. Uh, the $2,500 limit is per person, so if a husband and wife both work, they could each do $2,500, so it's not quite as limiting as maybe it sounds. The chart in the bottom is just simply showing, you know, okay, so this consumer-driven health care, it's, it's good um, because consumers are in charge of their spending money. 
But we're going to see some later slides here in just a couple minutes that the growth movement is happening pretty rapidly. And the major reason it's growing rapidly is the price. And if you look at the most recent year, 2011, the average family high deductible health plan, which is what you need to have in order to have an HSA, um, cost about $12,600. For a non-high deductible health plan or a non-HSA eligible plan, it's $15,000 something dollars. The difference between those two is about $2,700. And I think that's fairly typical. You know, different states matter a lot, different families matter, different policies matter. But the savings of $2,700 is not, that, that's reasonable on average. It is the average. Um, but if you think about somebody making the decision to buy the $15,000 plan or the $12,000, that immediate savings is pretty attractive. But then when you add in the factor that you can take that $2,700 and put it into an HSA and spend it as you please uh, makes HSAs pretty attractive. And that's really the driving, the driving factor be behind HSAs. What are the benefits of a high deductible health plan and an HSA? Uh, the high deductible health plan is the insurance part. The biggest benefit we just mentioned is lower premiums. So most people want lower premiums. The benefit of the HSA is you control the money. The individual gets control over their own health care dollars. Um, which is nice. So if you have a, um, you know, I recently had a doctor situation where I was referred from another doctor, and uh, I had to go to that, the doctor I was referred to. And if I wanted to go to a doctor other than that, my insurance policy really didn't allow that. HSA plans give you the money. You can decide who you want to go to and just pay for it. Uh, tax savings. I don't want to get too into the tax savings, but it's actually probably the most important aspect of health savings accounts. Health savings accounts are tax-driven vehicles. It would not exist if it weren't for the tax issue. You would not exist. The role of custodian, the whole reason you're in this webinar today, the reason HSAs are being driven through banks and, and um, credit unions and other financial institutions is because of the tax nature of an HSA account. Um, and that tax nature is very, very important. It, it puts the HSA on a level playing field with other medical insurance in that the individual gets it pre-tax, pre-FICA, pre-FUTA, pre-state, and pre-federal income taxes in most cases. Um, so that's a very nice feature of HSAs. It's also part of a broader health care alternative. Um, HSAs not only give individuals the control of their money, um, but it allows those individuals to try things that maybe their insurance company wouldn't let them try. So things like holistic medicine or um, homeopathic medicine, some more um, innovative maybe or alternative forms of medical practice that the insurance companies might frown upon. Uh, the HSA um, gives the individual the money. So there's a little bit more freedom on what they do with their health care spending, which is nice. It also provides an employee safety net between jobs, which we'll talk a little bit more. But when people lose their jobs in America because health insurance has been tied to employment so tightly, um, that's been a very, very serious problem from a health insurance policy perspective. The HSAs don't totally solve that problem, but it gives people a nest egg of money, hopefully they built up in their HSA, that they can use to cover periods of unemployment. You know, have consumer um, health plans been accepted? Um, they have. This just kind of shows some growth. You know, you're in a business that's growing rapidly. Hopefully you're, you're seeing more and more HSA accounts. I think most people expect that growth to continue, um, although the health care reform is going to put some question marks there. Um, but you can see there's about 20 million Americans that are eligible for HSAs. Uh, the side note there is important, and it's important um, for a number of reasons, but only about half of the people eligible for HSAs open HSAs. So a lot of people faced with that decision of whether to spend 12000 for a medical health insurance policy or 15000 might choose the $12,000 policy, but then not spend the extra $3,000 for an HSA. They just don't open one. And I think that presents an educational challenge for us in the business. Those people really are, in my view, better served with an HSA, even someone who um, you know, considers themselves, you know, bulletproof. They're never going to have to have any medical expenses. They're still better off opening an HSA. Um, but, you know, people don't have the money in some cases. And uh, it, it, for whatever reasons, only about half of Americans that are eligible for HSAs are opening them. I think that's an important statistic to realize um, 
because uh, it, it affects you know, how many HSA accounts you might get. Uh, some employer information. A lot of this is still employer-driven. About 40% of employers that offer um, HSA coverage do provide some sort of a contribution, a gift amount of money. Uh, so that helps. On average, those numbers are about $886 a year for single people and $1,500 a year for families. So as you get into this business, employers might ask, and, and I get asked quite a bit, you know, do I have to give any money to it? 